Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammedin seyyidil enbiya ve mursalin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Moving on through the uh, austere but deep days of the month of Ramadan, considering the, the culmination, hoping that the days past have not been idly and uselessly spent, we consider how the entire moral life of the believer is tied up with the spiritual discipline that Ramadan represents. Ramadan is a kind of mutawwa' or muhtasib, a kind of scrutinizing figure that watches us carefully and makes us aware of the divine awareness. Insha'Allah we don't look at the haram in this month. Insha'Allah we don't consume or eat the haram. Insha'Allah we don't miss our prayers. Insha'Allah we're just better. We're in a state of istiqama, a little bit more in this month. And one of the gifts that Ramadan has is that we realize, first of all, that actually we can do it. So many people who are unfortunate enough not to say their prayers outside the month of Ramadan realize in the month of Ramadan that actually they can do it and they don't have an excuse and they are able to maintain the practice after the month is done. It's a step up for so many people. It's really all khair, it's all good, it's all blessing. It's a divine gift. One of the things also that our heightened sensibility during the month uh, alerts us to is the importance not just of restraining what goes into the mouth, but what comes out of the mouth by way of lahu al hadith, idle talk, futile talk, forbidden talk. Inshallah, we remember in this month the importance of treating the mouth as a kind of cage and making sure that the teeth shut in anything that is inappropriate. The hadith says, and it's a sound hadith, Man lam yada al kadib wa qawl al zur, whoever does not renounce lying and bearing false witness, Allah has no need of him. And yada ta'amahu wa sharaba of him leaving aside his food and his drink. So this suggests that this is really important. Hmm? We need to engage in kaffal lisan, keeping back the tongue. This is an ancient wisdom and it's an eternal wisdom because what Ramadan teaches us is a fundamental aspect of being human and of being sacred. There's nothing out of date or specifically medi it's all about we know these are the immediate problems that we have. All of our individual internal problems are uh, related directly to the solutions that Ramadan is offering. So we have this principle of samt, silence, which doesn't necessarily mean taking a vow of silence, like Hazrat Maryam, but not saying so much. And perhaps when the blood sugar level is low and we're feeling less ebullient and defiant, uh, we're not so inclined to chatter away this lahu al-hadith. Hmm. Lahu al-hadith, talking about things that don't really matter in sharia, is not haram, but it's considered technically to be tark al-awla, in other words, renouncing what would be better. You could say something that people will benefit from, there's an embarrassing pause in the conversation, you want to fill it with something, you've got guests. You can talk about you know, Chelsea's chances now that Abramovich is no more. Well, fine, <laughs> nobody's going to say that's un-Islamic. But you could also say, uh, I read a hadith recently that I'd never heard of before, uh, and this is it, does anybody know? Have you heard? And that's a legitimate way of filling that time. So watching, muraqaba, the things that we say in this month. And one aspect of this also, it seems to me, is that ours is an age of communication, mass communication, excessive communication, everybody up to their eyeballs in messages. Images and messages 
shot at us, bombarded at us by mega corporations that are competing with each other for our attention and we are so jaded that they have to use more and more exciting and extreme images and messaging and nobody knows when that will stop. But it's become quite, quite crude and quite extreme and it's often designed by psychologists and neurologists in order to make the brain light up when we see some image or whatever it might be. This is not good for us, particularly in the month of Ramadan, which should be a time of stillness and contemplation, so that we are actually present in our prayers. Just as it's hard to concentrate on a piece of serious work, or on reciting the Qur'an, or even hard to go to sleep if, um, if the few minutes beforehand you've been bombarded with 50 new text messages telling you this or worrying you about that. It's, the human brain can't just be switched on and off when it's lit up by this messaging. So in the month of Ramadan we need to be switching off from those messages. Uh, and psychologists <coughs> have done many studies of young people in particular and their overdosing on social media and texting and notifications and the endless bombardment. Uh, and they come up with all kinds of new acronyms. One of them is FOMO, fear of missing out. Young people really don't want to miss the latest video about who is doing what, uh, and so they watch it. And you can see them on trains and they're plugged in and they're just scrolling and scrolling, looking at whatever is new, so that when they text their friends back or when they talk to them physically, which still sometimes happens, they're, they're in the loop. And the status anxiety that comes from not having seen the latest video um, is eliminated. And this is really very unhealthy because the brain is really designed for a very simple lifestyle, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, when there aren't millions of stimulations. And people are sitting back and looking at the clouds and wondering when the wind will change so that perhaps the herd of bison will come their way. That's really what we're for. We're not designed for this overload of messaging still less for this overload of really trivial messaging. And so uh, it seems to me that one of the things we can do to get more out of the fasting month is just to switch the devices off. So many people go through their lives with the latest mobile phones, checking them every two minutes. That's never really useful. Maybe if you're in a certain line of work, you're a journalist or something, you have a deadline, you have to catch the late, maybe. But most of us are not like that. Most of us can check their messages maybe five times a day max. And not right before going to sleep, because you're really going to do something about it when it, you're about to go to sleep. And in Ramadan, we really need to watch our sleep and to make sure that we get that proper sleep, that REM sleep. Uh, because Fajr is still early, Tarawih is still late, most of us have to work, bosses don't like it if you take a qailula, a nap, in the early afternoon, uh, and towards the end of Ramadan there can be real fatigue setting in which can diminish what we get out of the, out of the fast. So, yeah, switch it off before going to sleep. This should be a good Ramadan practice. I would suggest no blue light screening between witr prayer and going to sleep. That blue light from the screen is something that replicates aspects of the spectrum that daylight uses and therefore the brain is programmed to, to wake up when it sees that kind of light. Keep it off at night. Uh, I have students who report that they've even found that they have texted while asleep. Sleep texting is a phenomenon now, apparently. Um, this can't be good. In some universities, surveys indicate that students send 3,000 texts a month. This is not good. What percentage of them is really useful <laughs> to their moral or their spiritual or their academic lives? Uh, maybe five of those messages might be. So uh, this Islamic virtue of <coughs> sumpt of silence, of recognizing the value of contemplation, of avoiding useless talk has to be extended into the digital realm nowadays. And it's very unfortunate in some of the mosques. It's annoying when somebody's embarrassing ringtone goes off in the middle of the 17th rakah and everybody, a thousand people, are wondering, is he going to switch it off? 
How long is it going on for? Is it going to, and that's really bad. A thousand people have their Ibada disrupted. Uh, but we should really, generally, as a routine, keep our phones off during the month of Ramadan. On during working hours, if that's necessary for your work. Switch it on if you need a lift back home. But otherwise, keep it off. And don't scroll during khutbahs and bayans. And don't look at the latest nonsense. Don't tell people where you are. Don't take selfies. Don't record the tarawih, all of that stuff. And if you're doing an umrah during Ramadan, don't say la bake, la bake, while you're holding up your phone so that auntie so-and-so can see what's going on as if she doesn't know what happens during the umrah. Don't do that. That's become a kind of pestilential thing in the haram. Unfortunately, it's out of control. So these are uh, beautiful aspects of the sunnah. And another aspect of it, which also applies to the digital realm, as well as to our normal conversation, is uh, jidal, argumentation, mm. raising voices in the mosque. This is the sunnah. This is not the sunnah. Please keep your baby quiet. My baby is getting baraka from the mosque. All of that argumentation, if it has to happen, take it outside because other people don't want to hear, and it's very bad for your inner state, because the soul really needs to be in a particular contemplative, receptive, tender state if the, the miracle of the Qur'an is really going to work its enchantment upon the soul. Any kind of agitation is, is a veil and gets in the way of that. Imam Malik used to say, Al-mira'u yuqsil qulub. Argumentation hardens the heart. That's a subtle thing. What does it mean for the heart to be uh, hard? Well, we know it intuitively. A, a cardiogram isn't going to show it. It's an inner thing. The hardness of the heart really means uh, an obstruction against everything that is beneficial to us because it is the heart, the conscience, the inner nature of ourselves that perceives the subtlety in the world, which is the basis of faith, that really understands other people, that it receives beauty in nature, that receives the miracle of the, the Qur'an. Uh, we don't want that to be obstructed. الدغائن, Imam Malik says, and it causes rancor amongst human beings. That is exactly not what Ramadan is about. Ramadan is a time for forgiveness, for atonement, for support of the poor, for a certain brokenheartedness that makes us more human. And this is uh, vital. Imam al-Ghazali says, لا ينجو من شر اللسان إلا من قيده بلجام الشر Which means nobody escapes from the evil that the tongue does without reining it with the bridle of the sharia. In other words, revelation. What revelation has said about good speech and the warnings that it makes about evil speech, about lying, about bearing false witness, about backbiting, about raising suspiciousness about people, about a hostile glance, anything that interrupts the natural benign flow of human fraternity in a religious community and introduces the demonic principle of the, of the ego, hmm, that has to be held back. One of the early Muslims said, Lisani sabaun, huh? In arsaltuhu akalani. <laughs> My tongue is like a wild, a wild cat or a lion. If I let it go, it attacks me. What does he mean by that? It means that because it's following the egotis, egotistic desire to criticize this person, that person's not praying long enough, that person's thawb isn't long enough, that sister's hijab, whatever it might be that's distracting us from the real reason why we should be in the mosque, and is usually the result of our own insecurity because we like to feel better than others. That's usually why we criticize them. Mm -hmm. That we are the ones who are the victims. Mm -hmm. We get bitten by that lion. They may not know that we're looking down on them, it may not affect them at all, but it does affect us, always. And we don't want this to destroy Ramadan, this little squishy thing in, in the mouth. Keep it locked up. Watch what you say. Make sure that whatever you say is fraternal in the correct Islamic spirit of ibadah and ukhuwa. 
So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month that we might be people of beautiful speech, that we might be people of sabr, that we might be people who spread the wing of kindness and mercy to the believers, that we might have patience with each other, and that the mosques can be places perfumed only with good speech, inshallah, and that our fasting is not vitiated or corrupted or made mediocre or even intrinsically violated and broken by lazy discourse. If we have the discipline not to eat and drink, we should be able to summon the discipline to restrain what comes out of the mouth as well, inshallah. May Allah give us tawfiq in this and accept our fasting and accept our qiyam and accept our tarawih and accept our fraternity and accept our support for family ties, inshallah, in this blessed, blessed month. Taqabal Allahu siyamakum wa qiyamakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.